Uh, hello, my name is uh, Peter Dedick. I teach at Texas State University in San Marcos, Texas. And I teach interior design, and I also teach history, which just seems like a strange combination, but it makes more sense because I'm really an architectural historian, so I teach the history of interior design and history of architecture. So, and I kind of mix them together with architectural conservation, so the study of the preservation of buildings and, um, and interiors of buildings as well. So that's where it all kind of came together, comes together. So the project that I proposed is uh, the um, study of architecture in Chile and also the study after I go back of architecture in West Texas, New Mexico, and to some degree Arizona to see, um, to evaluate the extent to which at the edges of the Spanish Empire, so we're looking at colonial architecture. So, and colonial architecture is defined by as architecture that was constructed after uh, contact between the Spanish and the, and the indigenous populations, but before independence of whatever country or region you're talking about. So uh, in, in New Mexico, for example, it's the uh, 1820s. And in Chile, it's a little, it's around the same time, actually. Well, almost the exact same time, Mexican independence and, and Chilean independence. The idea is that in the very center of uh, the, the urban areas, um, during the colonial periods, uh, there wasn't much indigenous influence on the architecture or the decoration of the architecture because the Spanish held very uh, firm control of those areas. But in Chile, Chile was the edge of that empire. The empire essentially stopped. In fact, in fact the Native Americans stopped the, uh, or Native Chileans, I should say, stopped the uh, Spanish Empire here. They also pretty much halted it uh, in New Mexico and in the southwest of the United States as well. And I actually pass this around. This is a postcard of a, a colonial church in New Mexico. This is a, an image of a colonial church in Chile. And one of the things that when I started looking into this, this I found was striking is the incredible similarity in, between the two. And then when you look in the middle, you don't see this so much. So the question is, why are these adobe buildings, which is actually mud, right, mud buildings with stucco over them, why are they looking so similar on each end of the, of the Spanish Empire, right? So also uh, another motivation is that um, uh, this is ex the, well, my own slide, right? Um, this, this is essentially why in Chile these individuals uh, this culture is why the Spanish Empire was halted and did not extend all the way to the very south of Chile because of um, very, very powerful Mapuche uh, warriors, right, who stopped. Also in, in New Mexico and in, in the southwest United States, there was a Pueblo Rebellion, uh, which did not, uh, it basically was in the late 1600s, they, they kicked the Spanish out for, for a couple of generations, the Spanish came back. But it altered the relationship between the Spanish and the native uh, residents there as well. So, again, this is in New Mexico, right? But it's not it's not only the form that the architecture took; it's also the decoration, uh, because basically these buildings in both Chile, these types of buildings, rural rural religious buildings in Chile and in uh, southwestern United States, were constructed by native workers, right, indigenous workers. So, uh, and because the, the relative numbers and the relative uh, control of the Spanish was less, uh, the native workers had more influence. And so the, the question is, one of the research questions here is how much, right? So how much, how much, how much are, are these buildings on both ends a, pro a product of Spanish control, or how much, to what degree are they a product of, of native um, so, in the southwestern United States, you see a, a style of architecture called Pueblo architecture. The Spanish named it, obviously, Pueblo just means village in Spanish, right? Uh, and it's this adobe architecture that's indigenous to that area. Uh, that's another thing I'm going to be curious to see what sort of architecture, I don't think it's as substantial as this, um, was uh, indigenous here. Uh, but you can see that there's a merging here between uh, the, the traditional European uh, church architecture that developed in the Middle Ages 
uh, with the towers and so forth, but also with the materials and the sort of massing with this adobe architecture up there. The situation here may be a little bit different. But these, these for example, this is the Iglesia San Francisco in Chuchu, Chile, right? This is the San Francisco de Assisi's Mission Church in Taos, New Mexico. And as you can see, it's almost as if the same designers built these. They're thousands of kilometers, thousands of miles apart, at the opposite end of this massive empire, right? And yet they are so similar. So I was fascinated with that and, and interested in seeing why, right? And finding out why and doing uh, both visual um, uh, sur surveys of the buildings and then also some uh, archival research, right? So, and most of the research I do is, is uh, anecdotal and archival versus empirical, right? Where you're doing actual empirical numerical studies, I'm doing more um, you know, reading and, and archive work and, and physical examinations, right? So then you look at colonial architecture in the cities, anywhere in the, in the Spanish, uh, former Spanish colonies, you see very, very, very little indigenous influence. And we already sort of, that's already known in the field, right? So you see buildings that have very strong European even if they were built by native uh, workers, uh, they are not. They don't reflect that very much. Um, but then, as again, again, as you move out, you start to see this 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 merging going on. So I want to really document what that is and to, to find the implications of it. Uh, and it's not only implications aren't only for the architecture, but also for culture, right? The cultures that still exist in these two regions, at the north and the south of this former empire and how they developed over time, and how that is reflected by these architectural statements that they were uh, creating. Uh, you know, it's an example here. And I won't go through all this text necessarily, but you can see here, for example, uh, this treatment of, of, um, of the, the material here is very likely traditional and goes back you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of years, right? And this is part of a mission church. This is another example here of that same kind of uh, structure here, which does not reflect Spanish tradition. And then again, this is just another example of a, of a, mer a building of emergencies together. Uh, so I've gone over most of this, but um, you know, the, the, the building decorative traditions, how were they expressed? What symbols that were used that go back to Native American sources? Uh, and then also, how were the Spanish influences um, kind of distributed throughout uh, the Chilean examples and these American Southwest examples? Uh, because there were different different fashions that went through during this colonial period. And then this is an example. I just go out quickly uh, of a painting. It's in a church. Uh, it's in a mission church in, uh, in in San Antonio, Texas, and it's on the ceiling. It's it's, it's um, and it's this clearly, even though it's in a church, this is clearly not a Christian image, right? Uh, so you can see this is this is harkening back to uh, a, a religion of whoever painted this, or at least their ancestors, right? Even though they converted to Christianity, they clearly culturally were not we're not thinking Christianity here. And so I'm interested in seeing if this sort of thing starts to show up here and if, how I can compare the two. Uh, okay, and I'll kind of go through that. Also, some structural issues, you know, as far as how these buildings were constructed. And again, this is a Chilean example compared to a uh, Southwest American example. You can see the similarity again. And again, a lot of other places you don't see that so much. I'm also interested in investigating uh, some of the similar issues with cemeteries. Uh, part of the reason for this is that I just uh, am just publishing a book on cemeteries in, in the United States in the city of New Orleans which is, was once also a Spanish colony uh, for four, four decades. And I want to see, si to study similar um, um, phenomenon within cemeteries as well. And because of uh, the, the, the in academic interests of the people that I'm working with in the architecture department at University, University of Mejor, uh, I, I'm adjusting some of my um, uh, focus because of that. I want to be able to integrate well planning uh, issues, and also uh, these issues with the cemeteries. So, uh, muchas gracias. And, uh, if you have any questions,
we do, we do actually have time for questions. So okay. Any? So are there no places in, in between where you find similar architecture? That is, I'm not 100% sure. I found, though, that mostly not so much, right? So it, it seems, from what I can tell from uh, preliminary research, that, the, that as you move towards the edges, it becomes more, the similarity becomes greater than as you move towards. And also, there's a definitely an urban-rural yeah. dichotomy here. Right, right. So if you find yourself in very rural Mexico, you're going to see something more similar. And if you right. find yourself in the urban areas, whether you're in Santiago or you're in Mexico yeah. City or you're in San, San Antonio, Texas or wherever, you're going to find a difference. So I think it's, it's not just regional, it's also urban, rural. So um, I saw most of your photos from Chile are from the high Antis. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Uh, there is something really interesting. This is a very interesting NGO working in the high Antis here in the, in the north of Chile, actually. Mm -hmm. who are been working for more than a decade restoring churches, churches like uh, the altars of churches. So maybe it will be interesting for you to contact them. Yes. I can give you the contact of them because they're I doing, it's a group of, it's a cinematographer and a historian. Yeah, so I would very, very much be interested in that. Yes, that would be very helpful. And it's super cool the work because if they have to restore the altar, they bring people from the Titicaca Lake in the High Andes from Bolivia to restore it here, you know, like they invite native people to restore the Right. The church. So. Which in and of itself is a, is a clue, right? Right. right. Yeah. So, I can give you the contact. Okay, yes. Thank you very much. I we appreciate also that. We have the next idea of the uh, internet problem. Um, the person that traveled called Avalia y Garraza, who does the same thing with the churches throughout Chile. So that would be another contact. She's a good contact. Okay, yes. Thank you. That would be very, very helpful. I was the founded director for the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology in Arica. So the main projects are in the Highlands. Mm -hmm. So I can put you in contact with those people. Okay. A lot of research about it. Oh, good. Excellent. Yes, yeah, this will be very, very helpful. And so I'm really glad that we were able to do this because that gives me a way of actually to execute this plan. <laughs> very helpful uh, to have something like that. Uh, <laughs> like a methodology. Uh, okay. Yes. Would, would you be publishing a book uh, on the Chilean cemeteries as well? Uh, I may I'd probably start with a journal article uh, based somewhat on the contents of my book because a lot of the, the, the influence on the New Orleans cemeteries is Spanish, as it turned out. Uh, a lot of people think it's French because they always associate New Orleans with the French, but actually when the city was being really developed and when the cemeteries were reformed, the Spanish were in control. And it's really, uh, New Orleans has a lot of Spanish influence in it and it has a lot of similarities with other Spanish colonial cities, which is not really known as much in the pub, you know, popular culture, but it's, and the book kind of helps to uh, uh, establish that more clearly, using the cemeteries as a focus. But uh, one thing I'm really interested in, I mentioned that is, is taking architecture and the meaning of architecture and cemetery architecture, or church architecture, whatever, and then expanding it into an understanding of cultures, right? So you're not just looking at architecture, you're actually looking at architecture as a window into the development of the culture and history, the history associated with the cultures. Why, why Chile? Because my, my understanding of like South American and colonial history is that the Spanish had a lot more influence in like Peru or Ecuador. Um, and less so in Chile. So I'm just curious. That's, yeah, that's, that's be, uh, the, because it is just that, because in Chile is a frontier, right? And in the United States, we were also the frontier, right? So there's less influence in, in places like Texas and New Mexico, especially northern New Mexico. There's some, but it's, they, they're very similar to each other, whereas when you're in the center, Probably not so much, mm -hmm. right? And this kind of goes back to the earlier question, you know, like is it is it, is it a you know is it a, is it a regional thing or is it a rural uh, urban thing? But I think it's both, right? Mm -hmm. So that's. Yeah. But it's also a desert environment in both places because mm -hmm. when you go further into the other kinds of environments, it changes. Yes. The yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're not going to see those adobe churches in a rainforest, right? Mm -hmm. So there's an environmental ecology involved. Yeah, exactly. There's <laughs> ecology involved. There's, there are, there are environmental implications as well. And that's a great point. Okay. Well, we'll okay. Thank you. Thank you.